This is going to be the overview for the book of Hebrews, part one. The book of Hebrews has 13 chapters, 303 verses, and 6,000, around 6,913 words. Hebrews means to pass over. And the theme of Hebrews is better things brought by the Lord Jesus Christ. The author is Paul. Historical, the historical application is, it's written around 35 AD, and it's written to Hebrews who have received Jesus Christ, but were in a struggle with staying free from ritualism. And this book was written to show that Jesus, to show them that Jesus is superior. Now, doctrinally, as the book of Acts transferred us from the Jews to the church, Hebrews transfers from the church and goes back to the Jew. And this is the reason it comes after Romans through Philemon. Romans through Philemon are our epistles for today and the church age. And then Hebrews is going to transfer you from the church age to the tribulation. And this book will have application to Jews who miss the rapture. And they will find that Jesus Christ is superior to the Antichrist and everything else out there when they read this. Now, devotionally, this book opens up the Old Testament stories for us and makes them plainer to us. And it's a reminder to us that Jesus is greater than everything and everybody. Now, let's get into the chapters. Chapter 1, Jesus is superior to the angels. Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Sundry means several or diverse or more than one or two. So even though he is a God who changes not, he still dealt with people differently. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. In time past, he spake to the fathers by the prophets. Before there was a complete written word, he spake to the prophets through dreams, through visions, or even his audible voice. But now we've got a complete Bible. Now we're operating by faith, not by sight. And he says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but whom also he made the worlds. His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is heir of all things. And right now, the devil is the god of this world, but Jesus Christ is coming down to take over and spoil his goods. He's breaking into the house and binding the strong man. You see, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. He didn't just begin in a manger one day. He's the one who made all things, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You see, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And it talks about the Lord Jesus in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. No man has seen God at any time, but if you've seen him, then you've seen the Father. Because Jesus is the image of God. The only image you should worship is Jesus Christ. The image of God. Adam was made in the image of God. Adam lost the image. And that's where you get the saying, he lost his image. You see, when you get saved, you got the image of God. You have eternal security. And you can't lose it. And verse 4, being made so much better than the angels. You're going to notice that reoccurring thing about how Jesus is better than something in the book of Hebrews. Here, he's better than the angels. Being so much better than the angels, as he hath, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This is what the book of Hebrews is all about, is about how Jesus Christ is so much better. No need to worship angels, as Paul warns against in Colossians. They are mighty warriors, but Jesus Christ is so much better. He created all things that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, even the angels. 
He is more excellent than they are. He's got a more excellent name. You see, most of the angels don't even have their names in the Bible other than Michael, Gabriel, Apollyon, Lucifer, a, was a cherub, not an angel, but he's got his name mentioned. But the Lord has a more excellent name than even those angels. He's got a more excellent name than Michael the Archangel. He's got a more excellent name than Lucifer, obviously. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He never said what to an angel? It says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time? You know, when did I say these things to an angel? He never said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You see, angels are sons of God. See Genesis 6, 4. See Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. But they're not begotten sons. You see, when somebody wants to prove that an angel isn't a son, they got to remove some of the verse. They just quote the part where it says, For unto which of the angels said it, he at any time, Thou art my son. What about the rest of it? This day have I begotten thee. You see, they're not begotten sons. Jesus Christ is the only begotten son. The only son that the Lord had by a virgin birth. We're begotten through the word, but it's different than Jesus Christ. The Lord used a virgin woman to bring himself down into this world in the flesh. He went through everything me and you go through and more. Verse 7 and 8, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. A great verse on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. This verse shows you that Jesus Christ is God, because you got God the Father saying, Look, it says, Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. If you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, then that means you believe Jesus is God. The Father believes Jesus is God. The Father said to the Son, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The Father is calling Jesus Christ God. Verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. If you think your God is greater, your false God, then go outside and look up. The God of the Bible made all of that. Your false God couldn't make any of that. Hebrews 1.11 They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth the garment. You see, the earth and heavens may perish, but he remains. They wax old, but the Lord will never die. It says in verse 12, And as a vesture... Shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. You see, the Lord is going to, to fold the earth and heavens up like his vesture, just like he would his clothes. He's going to change his clothes one day, and he's going to put on a new heaven and a new earth. You see, he wears the creation like it's a pair of clothes or something. And there's going to be one day he's, he's done with it, He's going to take off those clothes, fold them up, and put on new clothes. Jesus Christ is the head of creation, and he wears his creation kind of like you would a poncho. He pulls, he pulls it down over his body, and his head sticks out of the top. And one day, as a vesture, he's going to take, them, take this creation off, fold it up, and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. You see, in John 19, 23, it talks about Jesus' coat. And it says, now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. So it's like a poncho with a hole in the top. And the Lord can get rid of this current heaven and current earth just as easy as he could take off that coat. And he takes his one garment off, puts on a new coat that's without seam, woven from the top throughout. He's got a little hole in the top for his head. He will put on a new heaven and a new earth with his head at the top. Chapter 1, Jesus is better than the angels. Chapter 2, Jesus, superiority over the first Adam. That's what you're going to see here. He's superior to the first Adam. 
Hebrews 2, 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him? That's a good question. What is man that God would give him the time of day? Why would a holy God leave heaven and come down to look at the Tower of Babel back there in Genesis 11? Why would he appear to man over and over as the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament? Why would he leave heaven, be born of a woman, and go through all the things that we have to go through? Because he loves people. He loves his creation. Talking about the first Adam, it says in Hebrews 2, 7, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. See, Adam was made a little lower than the angels. God gave him a crown. He had dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. But Jesus is superior to the first Adam. Hebrews 2, 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels in the sense that when he came down in the flesh, he took on the likeness of men, and men were made a little lower than the angels. This doesn't mean the angels are better than Jesus. We just saw in the last chapter that they're not. But Jesus took on flesh so that he could suffer the death of the cross. And he tasted death for every man. He had power to lay down his life. He had power to take it up again. But he voluntarily laid down his life for his friends just so that he could go to the heart of the earth, defeat death, steal his keys, and get his victory through the blood of the cross. And say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? He tasted death for every man. Every man has a chance, according to that verse. Hebrews 2.10, For it became him, for, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons into glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. He is the captain of our salvations. In Joshua chapter 5, he was the captain of the Lord's hosts. He's the captain. Hebrews 2.16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came right through that seed that you follow all the way through the Old Testament. He is the promised seed. He came down in the likeness of man and did it way better. The first Adam couldn't do it. The first Adam sinned. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, never sinned. 17 and 18. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. You see, he went through all the temptations that a man will go through, defeated them all. Now he can succor you that is tempted. That means he can help you. Look how he responded when being tempted in Matthew chapter 4. He used scriptures. He is the living word using the written word. So that's, so far, chapter 1, Jesus superior to the angels. Chapter 2, superior to the first Adam. Chapter 3, superior to Moses. Hebrews 3, 5, and 6, And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after, but Christ as a son over his own house, Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Notice the word house kind of reminds you of the house of Israel. And we're reading the book of Hebrews. So that makes a lot of sense when you connect those two things, the house of Israel and Hebrews. You see, we're part of the Lord's body even if we don't hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing firm unto the end. The end is the end of the great tribulation, which we're not going through. You see, the book of Hebrews is primarily for Hebrews going through Daniel's 70th week at the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. And they gotta, what they got to do is hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. The end. That's 
That phrase is associated with the end of the tribulation. Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure unto the end. What's Jesus talking about in Matthew 24? The events of the tribulation. So they have to endure unto the end. They will have to go through that time period faithful to the Lord without taking the mark. If you don't rightly divide these verses in Hebrews, then you'll end up applying them to me and you and the church today, and you're going to end up adding a condition to our salvation. You see, these verses are directed to a time when there is a condition. For one thing, if they worship the beast and receive his mark during that tribulation time period, then it's automatically going to damn that person. You see, but there's not a sin today that me and you could commit, that me and you can commit, that could cause you to lose salvation, or, if you're not saved, to disqualify you from being able to get saved. You see, there's no condition to it. But in the tribulation, there is a condition. And everybody knows that. They just don't want to admit it. But look at these verses. In Revelation 13, 15 through 17, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the Antichrist will require this, for you to get the mark and worship him. This is like the token of his covenant. You know, God showed Noah a rainbow. He gave Noah the sign of circumcision. Well, the Antichrist uses the mark. And look at the consequences of getting the mark. In Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. He worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You see that the mark brings automatic damnation. There is nothing like that today that can make you disqualified or ineligible to get saved. There is no sin that can cause you to lose your salvation. So this shows you that me and you, as born-again believers in the body of Christ, cannot go through the future time of tribulation and be in danger of taking the mark. This is proof for a pre-tribulation rapture. And I didn't say there wouldn't be tribulation saints, but those tribulation saints will not be a part of the body of Christ, you see. I've heard it over and over again from pastors who teach a post-trib pre-wrath rapture that a born-again believer in the body of Christ can and will go through the future tribulation time period. And that doesn't make any sense. Listen closely to what they say when you bring up a Christian taking the mark and worshiping the beast. Listen closely to it. You see, they say that a true born-again believer will not take the mark and worship the beast. You know, saying, you know, if you really are a true born-again believer, then you won't commit this sin. And that's kind of the Baptist way of teaching works without teaching works, you see. There is no doubt about it. A work is involved in the tribulation. There's no doubt about it. The person cannot take the mark. There is a condition involved, just like there was one when Adam first showed up in Genesis, what was the one condition? You know, he would have stayed in the garden for all eternity. As long as he didn't eat off of a tree. You see, there was a condition involved. He had to abstain from something. There's a condition involved in tribulation. He's got to abstain from taking the mark. So the person in the tribulation could not take the mark. But the thing is... These guys don't want to call that a work. Let me give you an illustration of how messed up this is. You see, I'm against teaching. I'm against this, the teaching going around where a man says, you know, if you're truly saved, then you won't get drunk. Or if you're truly saved, then you won't smoke pot. Or if you're truly saved, you wouldn't do the sins that I don't do. You see, that's a, just a sneaky way to sneak in works and say that, you know, you believe salvation is by grace through faith, 
but if a person is truly saved, they won't commit these certain things or commit these certain sins. But they don't want to admit that abstaining from a sin is a work. And whether they want to admit it or not, they are requiring a person to abstain from those works in order for them to say that person is saved. They say a person isn't saved if he commits a certain sin, and that is adding works. It's requiring someone to live up to a certain standard before you will say that they are saved. Okay, now, this same group of men who take a huge stand for eternal security, they take a huge stand against lordship salvation, right? They take a huge stand against teaching that a changed life is required for salvation which I don't believe a changed life is required for salvation. But they cross themselves, and they say a true Christian, they say, first off, they say a Christian, is going, Christians will go through the tribulation. Born-again believers in the body of Christ, they say, will go through the tribulation. But they also say a true Christian will not take the mark of the beast. Now, how in the world is that any different than saying a true Christian today wouldn't get drunk? Or a true Christian wouldn't shack up. Or a true Christian won't have false gods. You see, that's no different. They want to criticize the Lordship Salvation guys for saying that a true Christian wouldn't do this or that. At the same time, they say a true Christian in the tribulation will not take the mark of the beast and worship the beast. But that's just contradicting yourself. Taking the mark and worshiping the Antichrist is a work you got to abstain from in the tribulation. And if you don't, you're damned. There is a work involved. They just refuse to call that a work for some odd reason. If someone's saying a true Christian wouldn't commit such and such and sin, such and such sin is adding works to the gospel today, then, then that's still adding works to it in the future. You see, the truth is, me and you are saved by grace through faith without works. And there is nothing, not death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing today that a Christian can commit that will make him lose his salvation. There is nothing today that will cause a person, cause a lost person to be unable to receive salvation. No conditions, no works. We can all agree on that. Where we disagree is that there is a condition in the future tribulation time period. They can't take the mark. They can't worship the beast. And if they do, they're cooked. The problem is that they don't want to admit abstaining from the mark is a work. And if a, if they admit that it, even if they admit that it automatically damns a person, they still don't say it's a work. And then they want to attack. They want to attack certain Bible believers for saying that a work is involved. You see, we're both admitting that taking the mark automatically damns a person. It's, the, it's just that you don't want to admit that that's adding works to, the God, to, to salvation and the tribulation. You see, Hebrews is primarily doctrine for tribulation saints. And people refuse to see that. I didn't say you couldn't find doctrine for the church in Hebrews. I said it was primarily for those in the future tribulation time period. It's to a primarily doctrinally to a completely different set of saints than what you have today. You see, me and you today, we are in the church, the body of Christ. We have eternal security. There's no condition to our salvation whatsoever. And these verses that put an if to things and seem to add conditions, you wouldn't apply that to yourself doctrinally because it's not for you. And when you, when you refuse to understand that or have an open mind to that possibly being the case, you will hit a brick wall when you get to this book. You see, the guys who look at this book and don't rightly divide will always end up teaching that you can lose your salvation today or they will always end up teaching lordship salvation. It's almost like every time I see a guy deny what they call the teaching dispensational salvation, 
they end up teaching lordship salvation because they have to find a way to make these verses in Hebrews fit the believer today. And in doing so, they say works aren't required for salvation, but if you're saved, you will have works. And they run to Hebrews and James chapter 2 and the gospel of Matthew to prove it. But if you rightly divide the scriptures, then you won't run into all that mess. Now let's look at Hebrews 3 again and keep, keep this in mind. Hebrews 3, 5, and 6. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Notice the ifs in the verse, adding a condition. You have to hold something fast. You have to hold fast until the end. When you see the phrase, in the end, it's primarily referring to the end of the tribulation time period. He says in verse 13, But exhort one another daily, while it is called the day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So notice it says, exhort one another daily. Don't discourage one another daily. When you do that, you just make people get harder and harder and harder in their heart. So exhort one another daily. For we are made partakers of Christ if, notice the condition again, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. What's the end? The end of the tribulation time period. Notice how clear it is. Put all the preconceived ideas and belief behind and read the verse as it says it and believe it that way. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. I'm a partaker of Christ. Nothing can change that. There is no if to it. But there will be in the tribulation. There's a condition involved. But this will be part one. We'll continue with chapter four next time.